before I go into talking to Susan to say just a few extra words around her art and her practice, Susan was born in Tallahassee in Florida. I just love the name Tallahassee. It's an Indian name. It's an Indian name. And she studied at uh, Smith's College in Northampton in, Mass in Massachusetts. But I think what is an essential part of understanding Susan's practice is that she's someone who excavates and collects and has collected <laughs> unbelievable stuff whenever we talk about what is it. She just says, it's interesting, get it put it in the collection and develop it into some work of art. And people have said that um, what she excavates is everyday phenomena that lie within the recesses and the bypasses and the blind spots of our cultural surround. And I think these, um, these aspects of, when she, of the things that she collects is the revealing part of her practice. And revealing in the sense that it gets us all to think about what we are looking at, and to construct from already given fixed meanings, some new meanings to the works that she places before us. So there's, a, there's always a participatory aspect to Susan's collecting. So she collects, I think she sings for herself, but really it's also for us. Um, and I... Um, I have enjoyed looking at the way people work with Susan's projects and Susan's um, installations. One in particular, which we worked on for quite a while, which was uh, when you did um, the, the big Freud Museum, finally. And the Freud Museum, to those who know it, is a large display case with 138 archive boxes with objects in them, all collected objects. And what's phenomenal about it, we, I only realized that when we were making a film about this, that we placed the camera on either end of this display case and just let it run. And when we were editing it, we noticed that some of the people who were, had arrived early in the morning at about 10 in the morning when the gallery opened were still there at 12 o'clock looking <laughs> at the objects. So there is this intense engagement that happens when Susan puts together her collections. And I think that is also part of what we are seeing in this installation. And that's, I suppose, is what we are going to talk about. And I asked Susan yesterday, what shall we talk about? And I said, one aspect I do want to talk about is this dynamic of the collected object its cultural meaning or possible meanings and how those meanings uh, leak out of the, the frames in which she places them. Yeah. So that's, I suppose, where I want to start. And at this point, I think we can talk about not necessarily just this one work, which is a wonderful piece to talk about, but also maybe one or two early pieces where this phenomenon of collecting has been quite substantial. So I'm going to so throw that over to you. A dare or a question? That's a, that's a question. <laughs> that's a question. <laughs> First of all, hello everybody. And I really so enjoyed the choir that I'm <clears throat> sort of overcome. But I don't know about things leaking out of anything. But. Um, Yes, it's, it's true I collect things, and what I collect are usually things that are overlooked or that seem to me to have been bypassed in some way, not taken seriously, is, is basically the thing that interests me. So this is a whole range of objects from things that are obviously um, considered bizarre, like people's accounts of having been visited by aliens, for example, and on the other hand, songs like these, which are popular and very well known, but I think are uh, not taken seriously enough in, as, as historical documents, or postcards, which was a very early work of mine where I did a very big collection of uh, postcards, British postcards of rough seas, the giant waves attacking the shore. 
And the curious thing about these postcards was that they were all labeled rough sea so that the, the, the sort of mantra or the caption was repeated endlessly. And when I looked at them closely, I realized that some of the postcards were not of rough seas at all because they were parts of the coast that never have rough seas, but still this, this title, rough sea, was, had a certain kind of seduction uh, that overcame the visual evidence of the photographs on the postcards and so forth. So these sort of inconsistencies, if you like, uh, are what launched me into making work. And actually, I do want to talk about this. Yes, we will. Because Absolutely. We, it's here, you know. It's like, all right, the songs are, <clears throat> excuse me, are not all uh, protest songs. I think someone did say this was a work about protest songs, but that's not really true. Um, they're about songs which over about an 80-year time span have been popular for one reason or another. And quite often they're songs that, let's say in the recent past, have been disco songs or uh, rap songs or, you know, things that are considered to be popular music mm -hmm. rather than overtly in the, in the sort of um, category protest songs. I mean, there is true, there's one song by Bob Dylan in, in, in this collection. But when I was thinking about popular music, I realized that if you go through the history of popular music, you're really going through the history of history, the history of society, the history of culture. These songs mark moments, and not always moments of protest. Um, they may be moments of celebration, or they may be uh, melancholic uh, songs about a tragedy. They have a, a, a range of, of um, moods, if you like, mm. but they are all directly linked to history, society, and everyday reality. And I think that that is an element of music which only folklorists take seriously. The reason for that being that the words often get eclipsed by the tune. In fact, there are songs in the songbook which actually have that as part of the lyrics. Um, in that famous album called Fear of a Black, Black Planet that came out in the late 60s, um, there's a line that says, oh, the music is booming and you're forgetting that I'm, you know, I'm telling you something because you're dancing. Yeah. Um, so the words are here as an important part. I want to ask you, there's a hundred songs and you made this piece especially for Documenta, which is a hundred days. Is, yeah, there, yeah. is there a reason? Is that the connection? Yeah, why that's, songs? that's why. And also because when you start, I, as I think I told you yesterday, I had such a wonderful year just listening to music. <laughs> and it could have gone on forever, really. Yeah. But fortunately, there was a, an end. Um, and I also said to you that this is my personal collection of songs. I mean, for example, there are a lot of songs referring to Chile because that was a very important part of my political education at a certain point in my life. So I am very familiar with those songs. There are many other songs that aren't present at all that you all would put in, you know, because each one of us has our own little scrapbook hmm. of songs. But it is, a, it is a start on a collection of historical moments right. represented in music. Yeah. You mentioned right at the beginning, and we were both standing at the back, and you could sense the, the resonance of a group of people singing. Mm. There's something about that mm. dynamic, about having a reason to express something together through song, yeah. and, and expressing something quite pertinent which is, like I say, a historical moment or reflective of a particular time or a, a specific incident. And do you think this is something that runs through, through history all the way? Um, mm, well, you see, listening and singing, the, the, the two sides of it. And one of the points of this particular work is to create a temporary, and I know it's temporary, community of people who are all listening to the same song at the same time. Because that's part of what music does. It's not only performing, but it's the, the active 
the active listening and participation of other people that make the song <coughs> iconic in a way. But at the same time, as I keep coming back to the words, you know, there are songs in my selection which are in the way apologies for misunderstandings of mine in the past. And I'm going to name a couple of these songs as you may have had the same experience. There's a song <clears throat> that was popular in the 70s, it's called Give Me Hope, Give Me Hope, Joanna. Do you know this song, yeah. Give Me Hope, Joanna? Well, what do you think it's about? <laughs> could you have it? No. <laughs> but somebody else could, I'm sure. The re but you know that song. It was a very dancey song, you know, it's a kind of reggae beat. Okay. It's, it's, the singer is addressing what we believe, or in our ignorance, is a woman called Joanna. Give me hope, Joanna. Give me hope before the morning sun. But definitely said at night, you know, there's something going on there. It's not about that at all. It's about the apartheid movement. And Joanna is Johannesburg. And I guess some people knew this, and others like me did not know that. And there, there, this is one of the really interesting things about how the lyrics and the tune can almost be a mismatch, like they're going off in, in different directions. Isn't that fascinating that that can happen, that on the one hand you feel like getting up and dancing, and on the other hand it's about, about apartheid, and it's a critique of the government. So that was, I have to say that, because that was another element that became important to me when I was putting this piece together and why I did the songbook to create a place where you could actually get the information about yeah. some of the songs. Yeah. Now I got off this question uh, the question tonight. Yeah, the, the songbook is... It's not, is, we don't have it's, it. There's a version of it lying there. Um, it belongs to the, uh, to the whole installation and if you have an opportunity to go through it, it actually has some of this information in it. Um, we've had to make copies of it almost daily because everybody walks off with it. <laughs> so um, mm. I think it's about the third time we've had to reinstall the songbook. Well, I hope um, people can, we can get some of the books at some point. Yeah. And if we do this thing that I recommended that I had to do for documentary, because they said to me, you can't have books, you'll never, everyone will go away. Well, so we just attached them very beautifully mm. to large boards and then nobody could <laughs> walk away with them. <laughs> and, um, We'll do that. We can do that. Too. We'll do yeah. that, absolutely. And I'm surprised in Norway that anybody's walking away with it. No, it's just, they, just love, they just love the book and they love what it contains. And it's, it's an interesting thing to take home and read to your, to your kids. Yeah. I don't know. Sing on the bus. Get the people on the bus to <laughs> sing with you. I don't know. Um, but I want to come, uh, stay with this idea of the, 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 the context of, of the listener, the singer, mm and the thing that happens between, because it, it's also part of uh, the visual experience where you have the viewer and the object and everybody here is reading this, so there's, there's an interaction as well with this. And of course, in your work there is this, the, the, the necessity of the participant mm. to actually engage with the yeah. piece. You've got to come up to this machine and you've got to select a song and you've got to make a decision and you've got to play yeah. it and then it's loud and you dance and you enjoyed with friends or whatever the case may be. Well, yes, and also, of course, the thing about jukeboxes is that um, you can't go back and forward, fast forward and, you know, etc. because you're forced to listen to other people's songs. And, I mean, I grew up with jukeboxes. I don't know how many of you did, but, you yeah. know, you, you, you put your money in, you wait and wait and wait <laughs> till, till you hear everybody it's else's song, song too. And then you play so this yeah. is a very clever um, machine, mm -hmm. actually, because in that sense it does create a different kind of relationship among the people who are waiting to hear their song. So yeah, it, it's a participatory it's moment. A and and you, you chose this particular make of, was there a specific a reason for, yeah. for, for choosing this particular make of jukebox? A Wurlitzer. A Wurlitzer, yeah. It's a Wurlitzer. Yeah. They're, they're, well, they're only surviving manufacturers, and in fact, this is the last model that they made, uh -huh. and because they, they're not making them anymore, anymore. it's such mm -hmm. a pity. Mm -hmm. I noticed it's a very old one uh, yeah, in, in the we've other We've got one room. downstairs yeah. in, as well mm -hmm. in, the, in the foyer. Um, the, the, other, the other dynamic, and you, you mentioned the text, I want to stay with the text and go into some of these texts. When you were, when you were doing your research for this, um, 
and you said you spent a whole wonderful year listening, <laughs> listening to music. You also went around asking people to, to, to send in suggestions? I or, did ask yeah. a few people. And I should have asked you, I know, I didn't. Because he's already told me two songs that I agree, I so agree should be there, but they're not. That's why I have to accept responsibility. It's my collection in the end with my own idiosyncrasies. Um, <clears throat> I did, let me see, people reminded me of uh, Rebel Girl, which I think is a great uh, punk anthem for women. I don't know if you know that song. Um, and there's a Polish uh, song, which I'm going to mispronounce, but it's a Warszawiasko, which is a sort of uh, anthem for the liberation of Poland mm -hmm. in 1905 when they were um, like the Russians, they had a Bolshevik. It was, it was a, related to the Bolshevik revolution in Russia. Mm -hmm. But Poland had such a tragic history of other failed revolutions and so forth that they're sort of all encapsulated in that song. That was a very stirring song that I liked. A Greek friend of mine uh, suggested, because you know, I did this, this piece at, just after the banks had collapsed and as that year went on, the economic situation in so many countries got worse and worse and worse and particularly in Greece, as I'm sure you know. And the song is a famous Greek song. Uh, it's called, um, what is it called? It's called Son of Light. It's about, it's a religious song. It's very Greek but it's basically asking for, for forgiveness for anything terrible the Greeks have ever done that they could deserve this, <laughs> this awfulness that, That's they're, a long list. <laughs> that, that, that they're living through. Now, it's, it's a famous Greek composer, what's his name? Um, uh, Kadra, yes, uh, yeah. Mm. And he wrote this song in the 70s, but suddenly it became relevant again. And that's the other thing that I learned from doing this project, that these songs, at least going back to the beginning of the 20th century, there is a cycle in which many of these issues come up over and over again, and the songs represent that. And that's a kind of memory trigger, which is extremely weird to know that the situation of unemployment, for example, has had two other major cycles, and it's always been the source of popular music. Mm -hmm. Shall I just say just one more thing yeah. about this? Because I know I'm getting way off the subject. But when I was a child, my grandparents used to say, I don't know in what context, I can't even remember, they used to say, oh, brother, can you spare a dime? You know, and it was a song. I didn't know that. It's a cliche in the United States. It's a song. It's on the jukebox. I have Bing Crosby singing it. Now, if you, it, because it, it, I have a lot of old versions of songs. Now, this is a, this is a song about somebody comes back from World War I and he's begging on the street. He's mm -hmm. And then there are songs written last year about that in the, the United situation. States. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, there's, there, I have some posters uh, reproduced in the book where a man, for example, is holding up a big sign and it says, you sold your country down the river, you rat bastards, you know. And he's, you know, he's holding out his hand, his hand for money. And this is such a disgraceful thing that this issue would happen over and over and over again, with, particularly with returning soldiers, you know. So that was another thing I learned, is something about the repetition of history, which I'm sure other people have already understood, but it came to me in a different way through knowing that the songs have themes that are relevant 30, 50, 80 years after they're written. There's also this, this idea that music has this immense power and subtlety to bring people together in the way that that mm. choir kind of, yeah. the resonance of the choir when you're in this room where the sound is bouncing mm. off your chest and you're feeling it. There's that kind of power and then there's the power that, um, that's kind of needed in terms of mobilize, mobilizing uh, mass activity yeah, yeah. in a way, because a lot of these songs are also sung in mass yeah. uh, by, by not just small choirs, but hundreds of yeah. thousands of people simultaneously. Um, was, that a, was that a very specific yeah, no, aspect? It, it wasn't something I was searching for, oh. but it was something I inevitably found, yeah. because again, with the Chilean songs, so, one of which yeah, we heard, okay. then I, it was also the 
the Arab Spring, or let's say the spring part of the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. was happening. So I wanted to include some of those songs which are remarkable. Mm -hmm. Some of them very beautiful and traditional um, uh, Arabic music modes, and some of them using modern rap in a fantastic way. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like a song like that, that's sung with you know, such passion and, you, it, and feeling. That's the other thing. So the music represents feeling in a way, and it's, as you said, almost a physical, physical feeling, mm -hmm. because sound touches your ear physically, which is something that's always made me interested in working with sound. So sound is you know, vibrating in your ear. It's a very real relationship with the singer. Yeah. And when it's a group of people singing it, even more powerful. Yes. I'm looking around the walls and I'm looking at all these wonderful texts and I'm thinking, wonder if we pick one or two. Oh, okay. Uh, and just, um, there's, there's one in Arabic there which I don't understand at all. Which, no, no, I know. <laughs> But uh, I'm sure everyone who's been in this installation has, has actually found a, a favorite. I was in here the other day with oh, sure, uh, yes. a friend of mine and we were dancing to one. So I think there's a, everyone who's been in here, has anybody been in here and selected the song? Nobody's been in? You have. Okay, tell us, what did you, what did you, what did you select? Can you tell us? Duncanson Fry, okay. Isn't it a fabulous song? It is a fabulous song. Yeah. I first heard that being played on church bells in Germany. That's what, you see, this, some of these songs is a very personal relationship. But um, I was working on another piece which um, sort of took me all over Ger Germany and uh, going through one town in the former uh, East, yes. the church was playing this song and the tune is just wonderful. And then I later found out that it was a song that Hitler had banned, mm -hmm. and before him, Bismarck had banned it. And um, so, of course, it had to be. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, of that cyclic history. And there are so many versions of it, too. Brunel, what, a Norwegian, did, yeah. what song did you choose? <laughs> I chose the song by Stereolab, because that's one of my favorites. So Which one? The Stereolab song. Oh, the Stereolab song. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the, that's, that Stereo Lab song, for some of you who may not be familiar with it, it just had to be there. I mean, it's a su summary of uh, Marx and Engels. I mean, it's a brilliant song. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a sort of, their video of it shows this bunch of, you know, very, very chilled out kind of London young people sitting around being blasé while listening to this song. It's actually, you know, their ironic take on it, but it's a very interesting song, yeah. Were you surprised to find it? Yes, I was. Yeah. Good. Because it's this, it is this thing about coming to the jute box, standing there and looking at the list. Yes, exactly. and, and, and what, what you mentioned in your, in your, in your um, little note to this piece, is what, what it triggers. Mm. Every song triggers, if, you, if, you, if you've heard it or sung it or been mm. part of the time, it, it automatically just triggers a memory. And I think that's the magic of it because then you don't let go. Then you want to find the next song that does yeah. the same thing. And it's, it's an interesting kind of personal experience. So it's like, but it's I, I always say you, you think you're collecting for yourself, but actually you're doing us the yeah. big favor. But it's also a collective experience if several of you were in the room at the same time. Yeah. And I think I told you about the snotty young German journalist who started to write an article. Well, his article started like, I call this art. All she did was, mm -hmm. and then, then he relented halfway down the page and he said, well, actually, that's what he had thought. But then he went into the room with two friends of his and some other people and a song came up, which is, uh, some of you may know this song, it's a few years old too, it's called The Eve of Destruction. And it could be written about now because it starts off the whole world is exploding, you know, there are riots in this country and that country. And he said, he sat down, he listened to this song 
And he suddenly, you know, like his past came flooding back and he looked at his two friends and they were all sitting there with peculiar smiles on their faces, he said, because everyone was sharing this, the feeling that that particular song evokes. And that's mm -hmm. what you meant by yeah. the collective aspect. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so when you played your song, Bruno, were you, was anyone else in the room? Did you share it with anyone? No. You were on your own. No, you were a lucky no. man. <laughs> And you, Andrea, when you, when you shared it? Did you share it? There were some people. Actually, it was, it was during a tour, I guess. So, uh -huh. I had so you had an audience with an audience. audience. Uh -huh. And I hadn't actually tried it myself, so I was really happy. But it, there was this moment where we had to wait. You have to wait. Yeah. To the other songs that people yeah. Yeah. put there, which was nice. So we could maybe listen to Well, at least everyone's not playing. She works hard for the money. <laughs> <laughs> Because in Germany, that song was played so many times, I thought I might go insane. And, um, and people, it must have been a huge hit in Germany. I mean, that, that, that was the Absolutely. point. And, uh, and they didn't know it was about an unemployed uh, immigrant, which is what it's about. Um, so, you know, there are cer certain levels of disguise that songs, the writers of songs create by the kind of music. They put, put a disco tune to a, a sad story of immigration. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. There are a lot of songs about immigration, actually, on, the on this. Bus. There's yeah. also a lot of songs about work, yeah. em, uh, employment in some way or another, uh, and also war. songs war and songs of empowerment. Mm, a lot about empowerment, yeah. really. So if you go through them, you actually suddenly realize they're all these like uplifting mm. songs, which are, which are, and, and have to be sung in mass. But when you read the text, they're quite personal. You can reflect on them yeah. when you read the text, but when you, when you have to sing it, sing it out loud doesn't make any sense. You have to <laughs> sing it out with at least 10 other people. Yeah. So that gets right. uh, that whole sense of empowerment, That's which right. is. So, you know, as, as I sort of, not very systematic research went on. I discovered that I was quite partial to a lot of songs that came out of World War II, again, you know, when I was a child. So, so they range from um, uh, resistance songs, like um, Bella Ciao, the Italian uh, left-wing resistance song, or um, what's the partisan song from France, or these kinds of things, which are two very tragic songs to people who were in prison or in ghettos and wrote the songs before they were exterminated and, I mean, just extraordinary stuff. But as I was doing that, I realized, again, because it was in the news a lot, mm -hmm. the situation of the Roma or the gypsies in uh, many countries. And I think they were just being forcibly expelled from mm -hmm. France at that point. Yeah. And so I went back and sort of tried to reconsider this whole tragedy of World War II. And I did find these two amazing Roma songs um, from Auschwitz, actually, which are written in um, a kind of secret language that about blackbirds flying and bringing letters. Well, that's about death and so forth and so on. And I didn't realize myself that the so many Roma were killed in the war, oh, yeah. and they, they, it's called the, the Forgotten Holocaust, oh, yeah. uh, because more than a third of all, all the uh, yeah. Roma in the world were killed. Um, so I'm saying, what I'm saying is, at certain points I felt obliged to, do, to dig a little further, mm -hmm. and not just have songs that I knew mm -hmm. existed, but to see what other songs existed around certain topics. I'm going to throw this out to uh, all of you if you have any questions. We don't have a lot of time, but we have time to take some of your questions. I'm sure there may be some will have. There's one. Um, what would really be the motivation to, to disguise a message when the agency of a situation is so complete? Well. I love the song so much. I used to hunt it. I don't know all the words. And now you just revealed to me that it's about Johannesburg and apartheid in South Africa. I was like, what? 
Yeah. Uh, what would be the motivation of the songwriter? Well, some situations you can't speak openly about. Absolutely. And, and you have a sort of a secret language when you're talking about certain things. For example, that's, a, that's an example, but the Diga Duncan song is another one because during World War II, when it was forbidden to sing that song, uh, people who were in the German resistance would whistle a couple of notes and then they were immediately, rec it was like a code, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and I think that's, oops. oops it's come over here. Oh, it's okay. God, I look like no, Minnie Mouse. There you go, you're fine, it's okay. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so that's one thing. And then another thing is I was saying, let's say, let's take a song like, uh, She Works Hard for the Money. There, there was no real attempt to disguise the meaning. It's the, the words are perfectly clear. He, uh, Donna Summers, who wrote the song and sang it, went to the lavatory in a fancy restaurant uh, where they had an attendant mm -hmm. in her little uniform, and the attendant had fallen asleep. So Donna Summers asked, you know, why was she asleep? It turns out she had three jobs. She was an immigrant. And this was the only way she, you know, it was her, her third job of the day, and she was exhausted and she fell asleep. So that's all in the song, but you don't hear it very well because you're dancing. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, it's, it really wasn't an attempt to disguise it yeah. in that. And I'm sure you could all think of other examples of, yeah. of songs that, uh, that, a lot of the Chilean songs, for Absolutely. example, that, that killed uh, one of the main musicians and cut his hands off and so forth. I mean, so it's pretty dangerous being a songwriter. This was the other thing I was going to mention yeah. is this, that a lot of the authors of these songs have suffered severely for actually mm. writing them, either being imprisoned or killed or yeah. banished or whatever, uh, extradited, God knows what. Well, the, you know, I have a song from Tibet. This man was imprisoned for writing and another one from China, which is now the big, most popular Chinese song, you hear it everywhere in China, but when it was first written, which was uh, during the Cultural Revolution, um, the writer was put in prison and then forbidden, he couldn't play in, to large audiences after that, and only a couple of years ago was kind of, um, what's the word when you're brought back into public life, Re yeah. Rehabilitated. He, and he had this extremely big celebratory concert. So when he and all his other friends who survived Tiananmen Square were now a lot older, and it's allowed, it's, it's the song is thought to be harmless now. Do you see what mm -hmm. I mean? And it wasn't harmless when it At was written. It's, it's dangerous uh, writing some kinds of songs. I saw a hand, it was... Yeah, Yes. And that song, it struck me when, when I read it that the, the lyrics even are so mild that you, I think it's, it's almost... It's like a lover like talking a lover. to his girlfriend, so right? You, you, you He's really addressing Ch the Chinese authorities, actually. And it's particularly interesting when you see that a lot of the Arab, the Arab Spring songs, the early ones, take that mode, you know. <laughs> Why won't you come with me? I keep forgiving you, you know, this kind of thing, and mm. won't you give That's me code. something, and mm. blah, blah, blah. And then as it goes on, they get really much more outspoken. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then, so, then the, this book is really uh, so valuable because you wouldn't know the story unless the book gives you the little summary of the history yeah. of that song. Well, I, I don't know, you might. Gets, well, uh, it's true, you might not with the Chinese song, you might, because it's in, it's a Chinese um, music. It's hard for us to interpret that. It doesn't have the same rhythm or, you know, sonority that our songs have, but maybe, I don't know. Um, There's a hand there, and I saw a hand somewhere. Uh, no? Susan, I wonder, uh, is it, this the only example or the only, the only work, or the only piece? Because like Jeff Koons, we, we have some of his work in Norway. There might be one or two or three or four samples of the same thing. Do you, is this the only one? Is Norway the only one who has this uh, Norway has a song. I mean, I mean this... No, the installation. Oh, is no. this the no, only... No. An is this a, I thought you were accusing me of leaving Norway out. Is no. this an... Is this an <laughs> Are we the only ones who got No, this piece? well, this is the only one that sort of 
here, but the work, you see, the work, the, the work is jukebox, right. song, okay. and also book. The song book. Yeah. Mm. The book pro problem being that it's not available, but we have a substitute. Um, and the benches, mm -hmm. and that's all part of it. And the benches originally had headphones. The wires come up through the separation, and then there can be headphones on both sides, um, which is another way to do it. But that, that's up to the venue. But this is a particularly elegant ins installation. I mean, I think this is marvelous, and the room couldn't be more perfect for this, because mm -hmm. you need a certain amount of space to put all the text on the wall. Mm -hmm. And um, the people who did that must have been very good at it because it's, it's, it's hard to do this. Yeah. You, you told us that uh, you designed the furniture also. Yes, part of the yes, I did. I did hmm. design I, the furniture. I'd like to say one more thing that uh, before we leave, I think you should choose a song. Oh. And we, because I think it's very important because the, I feel. I think everybody should it choose. Is, a song. It is, well, anyway, we can. We'll I hope there, everybody we'll I think that it's something to do with which listening to I think it, it's, it's very moving to be here because it's yeah. a bit like we, being we'll, in a. We'll end with that idea, Syria. Okay, That's a great idea to end with. It's something, it's like experiencing something together, yeah. which is. Yeah. Well, why don't we do that? I mean, I don't want to bring it to an end quite yet. I just want to ask you. There's there's one song which, when I when I saw it on the on the list, in fact, I saw it in Documenta, and it, it kind of again triggered 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 uh, this uh, reminiscent or memory uh, effect, which goes way beyond the American civil rights movement, and it, it actually was trig triggered before your installation. When Barack Obama was in, inaugurated, he had a concert on the steps outside the, the, um, the Lincoln Memorial, and he had Pete Seeger singing, This Land is Your Land, and Pete Seeger was then 90, 89 or something, or just on 90 years old. And I mean, most of us have grown up with Pete Seeger, I don't know, and it was uh, an absolutely, for me, a remarkable historical moment, which again, as you said, had come cyclically because this was, a, this was a song that goes way, way back to the early 1920s and it's just recycled throughout all the political movements in the USA and that was one of a quite, quite remarkable... Um, it was, it's a good song. I, I actually have a slightly different version of it. Then, I, wanted, I didn't want anyone in there too much in the book and Pete Seeger should be everywhere. Yeah. And he actually has the American version of Digga Duncan which is uh, fabulous, and mm. that's why it's so popular. Everything he did, he had, the, he had a magic touch. He did, mm -hmm. absolutely. He also was utterly sincere in his, in his work. And so instead of having the Pete Seeger version of it, because I had to have him a couple of other times, mm -hmm. um, I have the... Uh, okay. This uh, Mexican-American group singing Sing. it with a certain irony. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, That's it's nice. the same song. Same it is song. credited to Because I've heard versions of it. We, we used to sing it in South Africa yeah. with changing the text yeah. to, to suit the situation. And again, in, in this hidden, this hidden, uh, hidden you know, language, uh, yeah. making it slightly different so that it, you, mm. could, you would be allowed to sing it. Because uh, it was one of the songs mm. that was on the band list. Really? Yeah, and you have a, a list song. of banned songs in Absolutely. South Africa. Lots and lots of songs get banned. You just can't. Just yeah. can't sing them, yeah. and uh, and I think this is uh, this work is actually quite an important work for this the celebration that Norway is celebrating now, mm. which is the 1814 uh, commemoration. Uh, this ability to re to sort of become yourself and do what you ex express yourself mm -hmm. and be able to put your voice out there with without any restraint. Uh, other than being fair to other human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the, the great significance of it. And it's one of the reasons when we, when we saw it in Documenta, we just fell in love with it. We just thought, oh, this, is, this has got to come to Norway. And I think we made a great decision to Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that it's here. I have a, a relationship with Oslo, which is very off and on, but it's that I have friends here and I've done a bit of work here and I used to teach here, actually. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and, um, Absolutely. So, you know, it's wonderful for me to see this here. 
and I feel it's, uh, yeah, it's very moving for me, actually. Great. Think about a song that you're going to choose. I'm going to ask if there's any one more question before I bring this little round to an end. Is there anyone with another special question? Somebody's raised their hand. Nobody at the back who I can't see. Okay, think of a, think of a song you want to choose. We have to turn the volume up for this, uh, Ulla. Can we turn the volume up for the jukebox? Because we can't hear it. Can, can a few other people come and um, yeah. choose songs? Yeah. First three who put their hands up can come and choose a song. Come on. Who wants to choose a song? U Ulla can choose a song. Okay, and you can choose a song. There you go. You choose one and Ulla can choose one. <laughs> Anyone else want to choose a song? You want to yeah, just come up to the jute box and choose it. Come up to the jute box. What's the other of your body? What's the other of your body? Some say your nose. Some say your toes. I think it's your mind. <laughs> I'm going to ask if there's any one more question before I bring this little round to an end. Is there anyone with another special question? Somebody's raised their hand. Nobody at the back who I can't see. Okay, think of a, think of a song you want to choose. We have to turn the volume up for this, uh, Ulla. Can we turn the volume up for the jukebox? Because we can't hear it. Can, can a few other people come and um, yeah. choose songs? Yeah. First three who put their hands up can come and choose a song. Come on. Who wants to choose a song? U Ulla can choose a song. Okay, and you can choose a song. There you go. You choose one and Ulla can choose one. <laughs> Anyone else want to choose a song? You want to yeah, just come up to the jukebox and choose it. Come up to the jukebox. What's the other of your body? Say your toes, I think it's your mind. <laughs>